Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Here's another look at the absolutely wonderful 2013 Toyota Tacoma mod for Assetto Corsa. Today, we're going to delve into one of the most authentic and immersive aspects of this wonderful mod. Don't believe it, because it's not a real mod. However, we're going to delve into the wonderfully immersive level of interactivity in this thing. It allows you to change the oil. Yes, an oil change on a 2013 Toyota Tacoma coming your way in mere moments. First off, why do we have oil in an engine? Well, it's to keep things lubricated and to keep things cool. Two functions served by the same item, engine oil. The particular oil in this particular engine is SAA 0W20 spec, as you can see right here. The 0 is a winter weather rating, so that means the viscosity rating at, um, I believe that is at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees C, so that's the freezing point of water, and then the viscosity rating of 20 at 210 degrees Fahrenheit or about 99 degrees C. So this is your viscosity when it's cold, this is your viscosity when it's hot. That's what the spec is on this engine. Zero W20, that is a full synthetic oil. We are running this stuff, Castrol Edge. No, this is not a sponsored video. No, I'm not being paid to plug anybody's product. Castrol Edge, full synthetic oil. Zero W20 is the rating you can see there. Absolutely no problem at all for this engine. Good, good stuff. We're also going to be, of course, changing the oil filter. This is a Bosch filter. It is the spec 3330. That's the particular spec for this engine, and we're going to be changing the air filter as well. Purpose of the air filter, quite obviously, filter the air that's going into the engine through this intake plenum up into the throttle body, which is over here on this particular engine. So, inline four-cylinder, puts out about 160 horsepower, variable valve timing, of course. Oil change interval on this engine is 5,000 miles. Initially, they said it was 15,000, but then they bumped it back down to five, probably because oil filters don't last for 15,000 miles. Little dirty secret that nobody tells you about when you buy your high-performance, high-end luxury cars that never need an oil change. Yeah, your filter's going to stop doing its job long before that 15,000-mile interval, so don't believe it. However, that's what we're doing today. Now, the first thing that one must do when going to change the oil is obviously open up your oil cap here. This is your filler cap put that someplace where it's not going to fall on the ground and then just pull up on your dipstick here. This is to relieve vacuum from the top side of the engine once the oil drains. The oil drains however from the bottom and if we get down here on the ground you can see where the oil is going to drain from. You will see that there is a plug right there, this bolt, that is the oil sump on the bottom of the engine, a dry sump system on this wonderful racing engine, because it's not a wonderful racing engine. However, you can see here, this is the bottom side of the engine, you're looking at the oil sump, this is the crankcase, the oil sump is the smallest, the lowest part of that, that's where all of the oil sits when the engine's not running, it just pulls up in the bottom there, that's the oil sump, and the sump drains right here, where you can see that bolt. So that's the first thing that we are going to be removing, and that's going to drain all of the old oil from this engine. We're sitting at just over 4,000 miles since my last interval, since the last time I changed it, so I technically don't need to do it yet, but I have some spare time this weekend, so I decided why not. Also, while you're down here, this is a great opportunity to have a look around and make sure that everything looks the way it should. Here is the left front suspension, the lower A-arm here. You can see everything looks pretty fine, I might say. And then, of course, your tie rods from the steering, going back up to the steering rack. Everything looks pretty good there. Here is our anti-roll bar on the front suspension. That's all looking good. Everything is square and true. The bushings are in good shape. All the bolts are good. There's not much rust going on. And the upper A-arm here, again, all the bolts are clean. Everything looking good. Here's our brake line heading into, obviously, the brake caliper. And above that, you can see a sensor line there. Just, uh, I think that's a maintenance sensor. No, that's the wheel speed sensor. Yeah, that's the wheel speed sensor going in there. Through uh, That shoots an infrared beam at the wheel hub, and that gives you your uh, speedometer reading. So that's good. And then up here, of course, you can see the strut and the shock absorber, the uh, coil spring. And then uh, inside there, there's a gas strut as well. So McPherson front struts on this wonderful truck. About 58,000 miles so far on it. So yeah, this looks pretty good, all things considered. I, I take uh, good care of it as much as I can, and yeah, you can see the, the payoff. Regularly scheduled maintenance. 
very, very good things. Let's have a look at some of the engine pulleys. No problem whatsoever. Let's get on with this oil change. All right, so I have already gone in and broken the uh, nut on the uh, bottom of the sump. So this nut right here, that's our drain plug. We'll position our drip pan strategically. And now, if I can reach, because I've got the camera in my left hand, and uh, I'm right-handed, so I'll be backing this nut off with my right hand. There we go. Make sure that we're positioned correctly, and we are. And we shall release all of that black gold, and it really is black at this point, because, like I said, not totally at the uh, interval, but we're getting pretty close, so... The oil is now draining from the engine. I've let it sit for about an hour, so it's not really hot anymore. It's okay if it's not totally cold. If anything, when it's a little bit warmed up, it helps the oil drain a little bit faster, but that's going to happen anyway because you've taken off the, the uh, fill cap at the top end on the valve cover, as well as pulled out the dipstick just to relieve the vacuum that uh, the oil pulling out of here will create. However, we will allow this to drain. usually takes about three to five minutes, and... Uh, the oil capacity on this engine is six and a half quarts, and with this synthetic oil, you really don't burn very much. So there's not much evaporation, there's not much burn-off. So I put six and a half quarts in 4,000 miles ago, and I will take six and a half quarts out. This engine really does not burn oil at all, nor is there much evaporation. So really, really good piston rings on this engine, I must say. Also, your engine oil, very important, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but it's always important to have a good look at your engine oil when you take it out, because if there are any little problems brewing with your engine, they will show up in the oil first. So if you notice any metallic flakes in the oil, that's not a good sign, but you will start to see problems developing in the oil before you'll detect them any other way. The oil in an engine is analogous to the blood in your body. This stuff circulates through the entire engine. It touches every working surface inside there. So it's going to pick up any problems that might be occurring in there. Just to give you a slightly better look at the sump drain plug, it's just a bolt. It's a 14 millimeter bolt, metric size. And uh, just always have a look at it. Make sure that the threads are good. On some engines, there is a crush washer that uh, sits here on this flange section of the bolt. Uh, my particular engine doesn't have one, but you might. It's always important to make sure that you either replace that crush washer at every oil change, or if uh, you inspect it and it's in good shape, just to make sure that it's seated here on that flange section before you button it back together, because that is the only thing that is keeping oil from spewing out the bottom of your engine when you're pulling three or 4,000 RPM at like 55, 60 PSI. So you would lose all your oil really, really fast at operating speeds if this seal is not good. So you always just inspect this, make sure that everything looks good, and this looks absolutely fine. You can see some surface rust on the exterior side of the bolt, but on this side everything very clean, and of course it's extremely well lubricated. All right, so here you can see that the uh, sump drain has uh, slowed to just an intermittent drip, and that is enough, so our sump is pretty much empty. So at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to replace our, uh, our sump drain bolt here, and we're just going to hand tighten it for the moment. I will go back, and I will tighten that with a ratchet. However, I don't want to lose it, and I don't particularly want to get the uh, inside of that bolt dirty, so let's put it back where it belongs so we don't lose it and we keep it clean. However, the next thing we've got to do underneath here is we have to remove the oil filter. Some garages, if they want to scam you, they will not change your filter when they change your oil. And if you don't change the filter when you change the oil, you may as well not change the oil. So, the oil filter on this engine is tucked way up in here. Far, far away from us being able to see anything. However, if we position the camera strategically, it is back a bit more from here. There it is. I can't see the viewfinder on the camera right now. However, the camera is directly underneath the oil filter. And uh, there it is. It's front and center, that circular object right here. Where, where I'm pointing, that is the oil filter that unscrews uh, counterclockwise, obviously, from our vantage point and uh, drops down. And this is what filters all of the oil in the engine. Oil filter, very creative terminology here. But that is the next thing that has to come down. So that is the next thing. Uh, there's no real way for me to film this because it's a two-handed operation with an extended ratchet. Uh, however, we will take a look at the oil filter once we drop it down. 
All right, so we'll take this opportunity to have a look at the old oil filter. This is what came off. This is a Mobile One M101, M102 rather, and uh, just want to make sure that the seal around the outside of the filter, around the mating surface where it joins up to the side of the engine, right here, this seal, there's a rubber gasket there. You want to make sure that that gasket came off and that it's intact because if this gasket is missing from the filter when you take it off, that means it's still on the engine, still there on the side of the engine where the filter goes. And when you go to put the new filter on, it's going to try and bump up against that old gasket there, and it's not going to get a good seal on the side of the motor. So when you go to start the engine, after you refill it, it's going to spew oil all over the place. I've had it happen. It's not, ugly. It's not pretty. So make sure that gasket is there. This one is there. It is intact, and everything looks good filter itself, it's not crushed, it's not dented, everything looks good. Last time I did this, I apparently put it on correctly and it performed as designed. Over here, obviously, the oil. Not much to see. You can see it's very shiny, it's black, and it's liquid. Yes, that's what it should be. I don't see any obvious signs of debris in here. I don't see any foaming whatsoever. So this oil's probably still in good shape. They could probably go back in the engine and likely do another 5,000 miles. But the limiting factor is not this synthetic oil. The limiting factor is the life of the filter. And unless you have a filter that is specifically designed to last for 10, 15,000 miles, it's not going to last for 10, 15,000 miles. So make sure that when you put 15,000 mile oil and you're also putting it through a 15,000 mile filter. Filters are very cheap. They just have little paper pleats inside here that increases the filter surface area and it just allows the oil to pass through and, and uh, filter any particulate matter that's in there. Whether that's junk the engine has sucked in through the intake and it somehow made it past the air filter or it's little metal shards from the cylinder walls as the engine wears, it's going to be trapped by this filter. That's why the oil filter is so important. The new oil filter, it's a Bosch spec, so we go from a mobile one spec to a Bosch spec. You can see the dimensions are essentially identical between the two filters, as well they should be. However, you can see slightly different design on the Bosch in terms of the uh, return valve here. There's a little poppet valve inside here that cycles up and down relative to our position um, to allow the oil pressure to build when the engine starts. So there's a bypass valve in there that allows the oil pressure to build more quickly when the engine's cold, and then that'll, that'll open up and then allow the oil to circulate through the filter. Slightly different design here on the Bosch versus the Mobile. However, they do exactly the same job. You can see the gasket here on the Bosch filter is intact. This is one thing that you always check when you're still at the store before you even buy the filter. Make sure that you've got yourself a gasket on there. However, everything else looks good. I don't need the old oil filter anymore for anything. I've, I've inspected it. Everything looks fine. So we'll just put it in our box that the new filter came in and then we can dispose of it properly in due course. However, we're ready to put the new oil filter on, but the first thing you've got to do is you have to lubricate that gasket because it helps it to create that seal around the side of the engine. So what you do is you dip your finger into one of your new oil jugs and you just slide it around the outside of the gasket and that is going to create a good seal. So here is that very simplistic and self-explanatory operation in progress. You dip the finger into the new oil and then you just slide it around the outside of that gasket on the new filter and that's going to uh, lubricate that seal just so everything cinches up nice and tightly against the side of the engine when you go to put the new filter on. Putting the new filter on is also a two-handed operation involving the uh, extended ratchet, this extended ratchet right here. So I can't film it because I've only got two hands. However, all I'm doing is putting this one up where the old one was that you saw earlier. All right, so we're back underneath. I have gone in and I have tightened the uh, drain plug, the sump plug right there. That is now tightened down with the ratchet. I have tightened the filter down and that is all secure. So at this point, we can go back up topside and we can now begin the oil fill process. So, yep, oil goes in from the top and it comes out the bottom. So first thing you do, put your dipstick back in place and our fill cap is already off. So then what you do is you take your funnel and you affix your funnel. You make sure the funnel is clean first and as you can see I've got some grass and stuff in this funnel because it's a little bit windy today so I've got to clean this thing out and then once it's clean we'll be able to pour the new oil into the engine. All right so our funnel is clean and it's now in our oil fill area on the engine so now it's just a question of getting our first 
oil jug. This is our five quart jug, so the whole thing can go to the engine. Because remember, oil capacity is six and a half on this engine. So we just go in and we carefully start pouring it in there. It'll take the whole jug, so you don't have to worry about uh, stopping to measure how much is left. Put the whole thing in the motor, and you can see the color change. Now this stuff is a nice golden color. The stuff we took out was black. That's because of all of the uh, carbon buildup from uh, unburned fuel, things like that. Contaminants, particulates that the oil will start to pick up over its service life. So, that's almost the whole jug. A little bit more to go. And that's our first jug added to the engine. I have one more to add. One more uh, one quart jug, so not another five quarts, because ten quarts would be too much for this engine. So we've got one more um, one quart, and then we need to add half of a seventh in order to make six and a half for our oil capacity. All right, so we'll add our sixth quart. Keen-eyed viewers may notice that this is 5W20 synthetic, and I added 0W20 from the big can. I had 5W20 left over, and it is okay to mix viscosity grades like this. It's summertime. I will change the oil again before the winter, so I don't really need that 0W rating anyway, because ambient temperature really, even in the coldest of summer nights here, is not going to drop below 60 degrees or so Fahrenheit. So. Uh, I'm not worried about that winter viscosity rating. The important number is the top number, the 20. So that's what it's going to be for the majority of the engine's running uh, time because that is the viscosity rating at operating temperature. So that's okay. However, if your engine is sensitive to mixing viscosity grades, don't mix viscosity grades. But I know my engine, I can get away with this. But for the winter, I do want that extra protection at 0W. So I will do a straight up 020 unchanged on my next oil change, which will probably be around October or November, considering it is August and it's a 5,000 mile interval, and given my driving habits, it'll probably be around uh, September, not September, October, November, by the time I get uh, around to it. Definitely will change it before the winter, though, and I don't have an opportunity to work outside like this, because I don't have a, a big enough garage to do this stuff, I don't have a lift, so all my car work I have to do outside, and I need nice weather to do that. Today is a nice day, as you can see. So, nice sunshine, scattered clouds, wonderful opportunity. So, definitely you take the opportunity to do the work when you can, and that's what I'm doing. I need to add a half a quart more, and then we'll button it up. All right, so I've added the extra half a quart. We'll take out our funnel, and we can place that aside because we still need it. One more thing to do. However, we now take our oil cap, we affix it like so, and that is now down nice and tight. Last thing you do, there's no reason to check the oil level because you know how much oil you just put in the engine. So you know there are six and a half quarts in here, for instance. However, last thing I always do is go back down underneath and check for any obvious signs of leaks, namely around that oil sump. I tightened it down with the ratchet before, so I know it's tight and everything looks good there. Of course, when we start the engine, we'll also check it for leaks once again, once oil pressure is up to that idle range. However, for the moment, everything is looking good. Last thing we do, of course, we'll come back around to the top side and we will empty out our engine bay from any tools or anything before we start this engine. So, cap, paper towels, anything else in here? Nope, everything else looks clear to me. So that is a green light to fire the engine up and build oil pressure for the first time. So we shall do that presently. Walk over to the side. I will get the keys out of my pocket and we will go inside and now we will very keenly watch the instrument panel just to make sure that we're going to build oil pressure and everything's going to be good. So of course, get the key in the ignition, turn the ignition on. Pop it into neutral. Make sure we have no unexpected errors on the caution and warning. So I'm expecting a check engine light, seat belt, door ajar, oil pressure, and of course the emergency brake. All of that is there, and everything is nominal that way. So we're go to start the engine up. Check we're in neutral. Clutch in, and fire it up. 
we're up. Nominal idle at about a thousand RPM. Oil pressure warning light has extinguished. Everything sounds normal. And that's good there. We'll go back outside. We'll check top side and bottom side for any obvious signs of leaks. The engine sounds good. No leaks on the top side that I can see. Everything looks completely normal there. Anything around this side that we can see? Nope, everything looks completely normal. Now, never go underneath a running car. Never actually go underneath one. However, from laying on the ground in front of it, here is what we can see. Trying to look back for the oil sump, trying to find my drain plug. I see it with my eye. I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera. However, I can see that everything looks nice and tight. I don't see any drips. I don't see any oil spraying. No problems at all from my perspective with that oil sump. Same thing from the filter side. I don't see anything dripping down from where the filter is. And from top side, once again, we'll try to look in that area. It's not very easy to see the filter from the top side. However, if you know where to peek, you will see it. And I see the filter there. Not sure if you can see it on the camera, however I can see it with my eyes. Filter is right there. There's the barcode for the filter. Everything looks good. No problems. Everything's nice and tight. The engine sounds good. You can hear the, uh, the lifters there on the valves, the camshaft spinning around. That's normal. Everything looks good. And we didn't have an oil pressure light on the dashboard. We'll head back inside. And we'll just give it some revs here. Everything sounds good. Cool and temperatures coming up, so the idle speed will drop off a little bit as it retards the spark and uh, the ignition timing a little bit. Once everything's up to operating temperature, the idle speed is about 750 RPM, so we're sitting here at about 880 or so at the moment. No problems. But the throttle response is good and the return to idle speed is good. No unexpected errors on a caution and warning. No oil pressure alarm. That's what we want. So that's good. And at this point we can shut the engine down. Turn the ignition back on and we expect the oil pressure warning light to come back on. And indeed it has. Therefore we know the sensor is good. No problems anymore. That's good. For today, though, we are also changing the engine air filter, so that's the last thing I'm going to do. Engine air filter sits inside this plenum here, this chamber. So, first thing we've got to do is we have to remove the spring clamps from both sides. First one and the second one. And those are the only two clamps that are holding this plenum cover in place. So, we pull it up and move it aside, and you make sure uh, to watch this umbilical coming down off the side, this thing that's stretching. You don't want to pull that loose. So, you just reach in underneath and you pull out the old air filter. It's actually not in bad shape, but we pull it out, and we can see it's a little dirty. I do clean it out from time to time, but uh, it's about a year old, and uh, it's time to replace it, even though it's in pretty good condition, all things considered. So, there should be an arrow printed on one panel of this air filter to show you the directionality of it, which side goes up or down. However, it's not here. I don't think there is one on the new filter either. Then again, I didn't look for it when I was in the store. Always, it's just a good habit to get into. When you're in the store, have a look at every part that you're buying before you buy it. Make sure that it's the spec and the correct type. Make sure that it's in good uh, condition. Make sure it's not damaged in any way. However, you can see the difference here on the new filter. This one's nice and pearly white. The other one was a little bit gray due to the uh, road dirt that it had picked up. I don't see any obvious directionality to this, so I am going to err on the side of better airflow 
and face the seam down into the bottom of the plenum and put the continuous side up toward the intake side of the engine. So I don't know if that's the, actually the correct way around for this filter. However, uh, it's not labeled, so I'm led to believe it doesn't matter all that much. Perhaps a marginal airflow improvement from doing it this way. Trying to do this one-handed is quite difficult. However, I shall try and persevere. Here we go. Get everything centered in there nicely. There it is. Get the plenum cover back on. And now it's just a question of finagling these clips to come back up over the sides like that. We won't lock it down yet. We'll get this one in place first. Almost there, almost there. All right, lock it down and lock it down. And that's an air filter change. And everything is back up the way it should be, I must say. Looks pretty good here. And I see no more problems. Alright, confession time. Keen-eyed viewers, especially if you have Tacomas, you might have noticed that I did not have the plenum cover secured properly. I had to go back and do that uh, the correct way. Little brackets uh, along the side here on the rear that maybe you can see, maybe you can't see. A little bracket here and a little bracket right here. Um, they have to go inside each other in order uh, for the plenum cover to come down squarely and make a good seal. I had not done that, so I went back and corrected it, but couldn't do it on camera because I needed two hands. But uh, you can see now everything is flush. This chunk that's missing, this just broke off one day. Um, I think it was the first time I had changed the air filter on this, and uh, it wouldn't line up right, so I pressed too hard and the uh, little uh, chunk came out, but it hardly makes any difference. This area doesn't get wet, so don't worry about that. I'm not losing sleep over it, and there's absolutely no impact in performance. However, uh, we're good to start up one more time, just to double and triple check everything with the new airflow, you know, make sure that we don't have any meth light on with the check engine light. I don't think we will, however, just in case, we'll get everything fired up again. Wait for caution and warning to clear. And it has. Back up, oil pressure warning light is off. We'll check our throttle response now with the new filter. Just the same as it was before, absolutely no problems. Looks good for me. Awesome, awesome. We'll shut it down, put it back into reverse, kill the ignition. And the last thing I have to do is to transfer the old oil into the jugs in which the new oil came so that we can bring it back to the auto parts store and dispose of it properly in an environmentally sensitive manner. Engine oil is not something you want to dump. It's just not. No, I uh, criticize environmentalist whack jobs all the time because, yes, they are whack jobs. I disagree with their entire political agenda. However, when it comes to dumping engine oil, don't do it. Bring it to a place where they're going to dispose of it in a proper manner because this stuff gets in the water, it kills animals, or worse, it kills people because it gets in your water supply. And this stuff is known to not just the state of the California, but uh, every state and country on the planet to cause cancer and all sorts of other big time disorders. So don't dispose of it just anywhere. It'll end up in the drinking water. It's, it's not what you want. You don't want to be drinking this. You don't want anybody else to be drinking this. You don't want to be eating animals that have been drinking this. So yeah, just get rid of it properly. And next thing we do, pop the tailgate. And we'll get our oil cans back here in the bed. We'll lay them down. Just make sure you've got the caps on tight so you don't spray oil all over the road. We don't want to be doing any McLaren Honda impersonations today. Do that. Button up the tailgate. And then aside from putting away the tools, this job be done. So, yep. Yeah. Last thing to do, just close the hood and call it a day.
and that'd be it. That'd be the oil change on the wonderful 2013 Toyota Tacoma Mod. Not in Assetto Corsa, but in real life. And uh, yeah, it is probably the easiest job that you can do on your car that will give you the best dividends in terms of long-term payoff because this is something that every engine needs. Every engine needs its oil changed. And of course, you got to pay attention to your intervals to know when you need to change your oil in your car. But this is the one bit of preventative maintenance that will save you so many headaches in the long term because oil, like I said, the oil in an engine is like the blood in your body. It touches every working surface it keeps things cool, and more importantly, it keeps things lubricated. Any problems with your engine are going to show up in the oil first, and if you see it in the oil first, you might be able to do something about it before it's too late. If you don't change your oil, you're going to have problems with lubrication, with heat buildup, and ultimately that's going to lead to engine failure, and that's very expensive. This synthetic oil that we use today, to buy seven quarts of it, it's $85. It's quite expensive, but you know how much a new engine costs for this truck? About $8,500. So do the math over the lifetime of the truck. Yeah, it's somewhat costly to keep up with this preventative maintenance, but it sure as hell beats the idea of buying a new engine every year. So change your oil. Don't worry about that. However, until next time, thank you all very, very much for watching. For RMN601 saying thank you very much, and we will see you soon.